and I, I'm, I'm very, very happy and thankful for the invitation to this uh, wonderful place and this great, uh, great uh, meeting. So I will speak about gene tests in research and from gene test companies, uh, com commercial companies, how far from personalized medicine. Uh, and I'm going to speak about multifactorial diseases, uh, complex uh, diseases now. So I'm a genetic epidemiologist. And there are four important questions in genetic epidemiology that we try to answer. So the disease that you are, your favorite disease that you are studying, does this disease like diabetes or trait like LDL cholesterol have a genetic component? If the uh, answer is yes, uh, how large is the genetic component compared to other factors of importance, uh, often different kind of environmental factors? And three, which genes and genetic variants explain this genetic component. And then the fourth one, the most exciting one may be how and what are the mechanisms behind these uh, genetic factors that are uh, associated with different diseases. Uh, here are some heritabilities for human traits. For example, around 50% of body mass index uh, obesity is uh, because of genes. Uh, uh, let's see, intelligence, from 50 to 80 percent, depending on what you are measuring. Uh, serum cholesterol, 60 percent. And uh, so why doesn't uh, Marilyn Monroe look like Mother Teresa and Mother Teresa doesn't look like Albert Einstein? It's because of these letters. Very much, not only, but very much because of these letters, ACTG in our genome, uh, the genetic code. So we have... Uh, around 3.2 billion of these letters in our chromosomes. Uh, in there, in the nucleotides, there are around 10 million uh, common variants, single nucleotide polymorphisms, which means that a single uh, base pair, for example, this T is T in some chromosomes, and some others have it's, it's another letter there. And then there are rare SNPs, individual specific mutations. So if you would sequence all the individuals in the whole world, so probably in most of these uh, uh, nucleotides, there is somebody somewhere in the world who has another letter there than the other people. Uh, <coughs> so this, thing, this just shows what are these single nucleotide polymorphisms. So like, for example, here we have a, uh, this person has from uh, father uh, got this sequence and from mother this sequence. And uh, this person has CC in this particular position here. This other person has CT. So different uh, nucleotides, and this third person has TT. So this kind of variations, and I'm going to sp when I speak today here about uh, uh, genetic variants. And uh, so now, around 10 years ago, a little bit more than 10 years ago, uh, there was kind of a revolution in this field, multifactorial genetics. And it was because of this genome-wide association studies that uh, were initiated, where you screen uh, millions of these uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms in large populations or cases and controls to identify which of these uh, millions of variations in our genome associate with different diseases. So this is from the 2007. Here we have the human chromosomes uh, from one to here, here to and, uh, and so forth. And you have, see here these small, small circles. So these circles are those uh, variations that were identified 2007 in genome-wide association studies associated with different diseases. For example, the strongest variant associated with the myocardial infarction was identified here. Also the strongest, uh, the most, uh, uh, the strongest variant for type 2 diabetes, TCF7L2, and the strongest obesity gene was identified. This was wonderful times. Uh, I was involved in, or I actually led together with uh, Sek Kathirisan from Broad Institute, a, a, a study, first study for uh, lipids and lipoproteins. So six of these circles here are from that study. So novel uh, variants that associated cholesterol levels. So we were in heaven because it was 15 years of research before this when we didn't find anything. And it's, there start, started to be a kind of depression in the field. So for most multifactorial diseases, no genetic variants, common genetic variants were known before GEO studies. So this is the map of obesity genes, uh, type 2 diabetes genes and coronary heart uh, disease genes, the common variants associated before uh, GEO studies. We didn't know anything.
starts to happen a little bit things here. Can you imagine that behind each circle there is a new biological mechanism that is associated with a disease or a trait? I still get like this <sighs> blood pressure uh, drop when I <laughs> look at this, although I'm now used to it. Uh, most of these risk variants are not in the exons. They are not in those regions that we, during those 15 years before she was, we were only looking at exons because the rest of it was like not, not important. Now we know that they are extremely important. So this just shows how it looks. So there are different uh, diseases. They, they are marked with different uh, colors to make it more simple. So I just take an example, coronary heart disease. Today, there are 160 uh, genetic variants, different genes that have been shown to associate coronary artery disease. And these are validated. So it's, it, these have been replicated. They are, they are real variants. Most of them have a minor allele frequency of 5%. So we all carry these variants. They cumulatively explain around 40% of heritability of this, this disease. In, on the top of this, there are hundreds of genetic loci identified for known risk factors, like BMI, type 2 diabetes, blood pressure. I always, already said this. In most loci, the actual gene or mechanism behind association is still unknown. So we know here is a variant that associates with the disease. There is something in this region that associates with disease. We maybe even can pinpoint a gene, but we don't usually know yet what is the mechanism. So, GIVO studies, and then a little bit more la later, so uh, also sequencing uh, uh, have contributed to identification of, in this case, more rare variants. And these variants can also be used in so-called Mendelian randomization studies, which I don't have time to speak here too much about. But it's a way to use this genetic information to, to study whether there is a causal link between uh, a trait and a disease. So, for example, here we have these 160 uh, variants uh, or genes that associate coronary artery disease. You can't see them really, really well, but there's, uh, many of them are, uh, are from uh, genes involved in lipid metabolism, uh, uh, for example, nitric oxide signaling, vascular remodeling. But the largest group of genes, completely unknown. Why are these related to coronary artery disease? Nobody knows. Maybe potential new drug targets. There are quite many of them. This uh, map shows how the different uh, variants associated coronary artery disease associate other diseases. So there are some interesting links also to other common diseases that we have not really earlier been, uh, been thinking in the context of coronary artery disease. I, I jump over this one. So can we develop novel efficient and safe therapies? for coronary artery disease. It's extremely expensive, as, as, as you know. 95% of compounds have failed in clinical development, mostly due to inadequate efficacy or unexpected toxicity. So can human genetics help in this context? <laughs> yes, it can. A good example is the PCSK9 inhibitors. Rare uh, mutations, gain of function mutation, loss of function mutations in this gene were already identified before uh, GIVO studies. And then after that, uh, it, uh, the monoclonal antibodies were developed that inhibit PCSK9 action. And 2015, FDA approved the use of these, uh, these drugs in the treatment of certain patients with high cholesterol. Can we use Mendelian randomization, this uh, showing causality to develop uh, drugs? Yes, because if there is not causal link between a trait uh, and a disease, there is, not, uh, there is no uh, way that the drug is ever going to work. So we know today, for example, that for coronary artery disease, all these factors here are causally linked. So if you can affect these uh, factors, you can uh, decrease the risk of coronary artery disease. While, for example, there are it, there are these factors. There is no support for Mendelian randomization studies that they're causally linked. For example, HDL cholesterol. Uh, that's why the HDL cholesterol increasing drugs never, never worked to decrease the risk of coronary artery disease because it's not causally related to this disease. 
Uh, in this development of uh, novel efficient safe therapeutics, it's something that is very um, uh, important, is the rare genetic variants, human uh, knockout models, so to say. For example, there have been identified several inactivated mutants that increase the risk. Those are not really uh, applicable for therapeutic, uh, 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 as a therapeutic targets, but there are several inactivating mutations that confer decreased risk. And there are already uh, several uh, therapies that mimic the, or, or the or therapies in the, on, under development to, to mimic this protective effect. For example, uh, these antisense uh, oligonucleotides targeting this, this gene, ANGPTL3, or, or the human monoclonal antibodies uh, affecting this, this gene. So, precision medicine, coronary artery disease. Let's see if we test 1,000 individuals. So, there are some people that have these rare variants that really affect uh, really uh, a lot your uh, cholesterol levels, for example. And then uh, th these individuals can have more targeted therapies because we know why their cholesterol levels are so high. While for most people, you have a combination of these risk factors. And some people have uh, many of these risk factors, while others have little. And here you can uh, uh, um, design more intensive lifestyle modification, early pharmacotherapy for those people who have high genetic risk. So, GIVO studies have shown us biological mechanisms or uh, are going to show because it takes some time. Potential new drug targets, we can use this in genetic prediction and they open new possibilities for prevention. Now I will speak about commercial gene tests. Genetic future. Want to know my future? You already know this picture. The revolution. The problem is, or was, gene test companies started to provide gene tests there. How much did we know? 2013, when there was more information around there, the Food and Drug Administration in the United States prohibits the biggest gene test company, 23andMe, because insufficient analytical and clinical validation of the tests and as incorrect interpretation of the test results can imply risks for the customer or patient. A false positive and false negative results. There has also been discussion in the Swedish media uh, about these issues. If we look here, the different uh, direct-to-consumer uh, gene tests that are available. So there are a lot of ancestry tests, harmless. It's interesting, they, 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 you can trust the results. It's interesting to know how much of my genes come from Asia, how much from uh, Russia or something. But then the rest of it. I have pinpointed one here, nutrigenetic tests. I have pinpointed that because my group has been working with gene-diet interactions in the metabolic disease for 10 years. It's an extremely difficult field. There is not much known. Still, these companies think that they can sell this kind of tests where they say, analyze your DNA, le learn how your body works, choose the right uh, foods for your genotype. They refer to my studies. But those studies were not designed to design uh, personalized uh, diet uh, recommendations. So, um, one month ago, I was, uh, I got a phone call from um, from a Swedish radio, and they, one of those uh, journalists, had made a gene test that you can buy in Sweden, and she sent me the results of this test and uh, wanted me to comment on that in the radio. So, this is the test one. Unlock for overwicked from dynamic code. So result one from the company was genetic test for overweight and obesity. The test shows that you do not have increased genetic risk for overweight and obesity. The analysis shows that you are a carrier of the TT genotype of the FTO gene, which doesn't associate with increased risk of overweight and obesity. Okay? Interpretation from the company. It means that you are not carrier of the variant of this gene, which associates with higher risk of overweight and obesity. However, a balanced diet and regular physical activity are important for your health, although you are not carrier of this variant. 
it doesn't make so much harm. Whether I'm obese, lean, or no weight, or what, it doesn't maybe harm me or my health if I know that I don't have a genetic risk for obesity. FDOG. They looked at that one. They didn't look the other ones. And today we know much more than this concerning BMI. So the result is meaningless, but maybe not harmful. But this made me uh, the same test. This made me more um, worried. Genetic risk for high blood lipid levels. The test shows that you don't have increased genetic risk for high blood lipid levels. The analysis shows that you are a carrier of the GG genotype of this gene, FAB, fatty acid binding protein 2. It's involved in binding transport and breakdown to blood lipids. Interpretation, it means that you don't have a genetic risk for high blood lipid levels. However, it is important to replace saturated fats and trans fats in diet with unsaturated fats. Mm? Okay. This is not good. Maybe this person who gets this result thinks, okay, I don't have a genetic risk for bad blood lipids. I don't need to go to check my cholesterol. Maybe this person has a rare variant that severely increases cholesterol levels. Maybe this person is going to die because of heart attack, because he didn't go to the doctor. He didn't take statins. Because the gene test says there is no genetic risk. But it, again, it's one gene of around 300 genes known to affect lipid levels. So unfortunately, the gene test companies often exaggerate the advantages of the tests and don't describe the limitations. They don't provide information about the knowledge of what is known about the genetic risk factors. For example, you don't have the FTO variant, but we didn't look at the other 250 variants. Some gene test companies provide information on hyperpenetrance mutations like the breast cancer genes, which, uh, or, or the, for example, the APOE gene in Alzheimer. And in th these cases, it starts to uh, be more near genetic diagnostics. So, for example, now 23andMe is selling the uh, gene tests in UK. So we would perhaps best decide and quick because it's here. So are we ready for direct to consumer genetic testing? Is this a good thing? We do need to know how to properly use and regulate this. The time to decide how these things are done has arrived. So there are some guidance now from for, about these tests, for example, recommendations from the uh, for in the Europe. So to achieve the potential benefits, a strict and common European regulation regarding the use is needed. Healthcare professionals should be properly trained across all specialties in genetics, and consumer training about appropriate use of genetic testing is required. How much do, does a, a normal doctor know about these things, or the medical students? To integrate public health genomics into healthcare systems, additional implementation research on the genetic tests for which there is an evidence base of clinical validity and utility is needed. Just a few words about the future. So what, what now? Once upon a time when we didn't have a clue, somebody said in the first presentation. Sweet. 1998. I was doing my PhD, screening for mutations, radioactive. I was very happy. If you wanted to look at the gene, you had to clone it first. I just wonder, I mean, to understand the future, I think the best way is to look to the past. So I think if somebody had, a little angel had come today, look, it looks like this, 2018. It had been completely impossible for me to understand that, or anyone in the field. So it will be so exciting after 20 years to see where we are. But I know we are so much more in the precision medicine by that time. So somebody also, also said that the young investigators, you should be so happy because you are living this exciting time. It's absolutely true. 
we are living the most exciting time in this field at the moment. Thank you. Thank you for a very interesting presentation. We have time for a question or two for Mario then. Yes, Karen? I haven't actually followed this field so much in the last few years, but before, a lot of these genetic variants, they were derived from studies of extreme phenotypes, right? Uh, I think, you know, but they were also then replicated in sort of less extreme phenotypes. Yeah, I mean, For example, in obesity, I know that you compared maybe always very lean people with almost more uh, morbidly obese. And yeah, then, of course, you could find... It, but then you, they were replicated in yeah. more sort of... It's actually, not, it's actually not really true okay. what, what you're saying. Okay, because, okay. for example, for obesity, most of these variants come from population studies where they are looking at the BMI in the population. Okay, so the body mass index. So, so there are those studies, but they are much... So much less of them. In type, type 2 diabetes, for example, it's uh, usually they have selected the type 2 diabetes uh, that is maybe not the most obese uh, okay. form. And so, so, of course, what you are looking uh, defines what you are going to find. Mm -hmm. but, um, but so, it's, so most of them are large population-based studies mm -hmm. or the mm -hmm. extremely large case control studies, mm -hmm. but also that they are really replicated. Yeah, yeah. And... Uh, mm. Okay, and then also how, how much of this is conserved in different populations? Now, was the population sort of spread over mm. the world? Well, different... Uh, the there are different, I mean, there's yeah. different linkage distance in Africans yeah. and so on. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, different, the, the genetic variation varies between different populations. Yeah. So we are, some variants that we have, they don't have them in Africa mm. and, and the other way around, or in Asia. Uh, also, diseases have different prevalence in different, uh, different countries. So there are pretty much this kind of studies now also. So there are factors that are common between different mm -hmm. populations, and then there are genetic factors that are specific for... For example, in, uh, there are some in, in um, Greenland, mm -hmm. some oh. very specific uh, mutations that we don't have in Europe or other countries. Any other questions from the audience? Yes. Uh. Of course, it's interesting to, to find the genomes in the humans which have a link to obesity. How do you see this play together with the, the microbiome? Because the microbiome, of course, also have an influence on whether you are obese or not. Mm. Thank you. I'm so, so grateful for this question. Then a brief answer. Because this is, my, uh, this is my, what I'm doing at the moment, mostly. So we are uh, approaching with 10,000 individuals in Malmö, where we uh, look, of course, about their genes. We are also trying to detect as, as well as it's possible what they eat and their eating habits and different kinds of things. But also the uh, stool microbiota. So, which is, it's, uh, I mean, I'm interested in diet and gene diet interactions. And a couple of years ago, when more and more literature started to come in this field, so it really started to bother me that maybe we come never anywhere in, meta in particular in metabolic disease, maybe, if we don't uh, understand the connection between our genes, the gut microbiota, what we eat, and gut microbiota. So, that's what we are really looking at the moment. So I think we will thank Mario uh, again thank for you. an interesting presentation. Thank you.